obviously the BRDC award. Um, got to talk about that now. Um, when you were announced as a finalist, kind of where were you when you found out um, that you were nominated? I'm trying to remember. I think I was at home. I'm not sure. I think because they, they announced the final, the like initial 10. Um, then I, I think I was at a racetrack in Alton Park and then they announced the, the final four. I think I was at home. Um, and I think on that, as soon as it got announced, I got an email uh, from Derek and the guys at Autosport and the BRDC organizing seat fits and stuff. So it all happened uh, pretty spontaneously. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's huge, isn't it? That is such a, a, a prestigious award. Um, and some of the people that have gone before you, as, as you well know, have gone on to great things in Formula One. You know, world champions um, have, have been through that process. Um, what was it like when you won it and then receiving the award in front of all those people was it a very surreal moment how do you look back at it yeah pretty surreal um it was probably the best slash worst night of my life because i was just sat there for i think it was three hours it's for those who don't know it's the last award announced um on the autosport award tonight so you arrive at about 6 30 and i think the announcement was at like quarter to 10 or 10 o'clock um and they're giving out food. I just wasn't hungry. I was just waiting for this announcement. Um, and they kept dragging it out, doing all these promotional videos. Um, and yeah, eventually when I won, I was obviously super happy, more relief than anything else because I've been waiting so long for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, I think at the time it was a cool week because I'd been announced as a, a Williams driver, I think two days before. Um, and the night of the awards is also my birthday. So a pretty oh, good present. Cool week. I mean, it's it's huge. Absolutely massive. I mean, I've, I've been to the Autosport Awards a couple of times and it, and the whole evening really is about that award. You know, it's, it seems like it's the most important award at the whole show. And it's the one that everybody looks forward to hearing about. And then, of course, the prize for winning that award is not only the, the cash injection, which goes towards, you know, future race seats or whatever, but is, is the opportunity to drive um, a Formula One car and you did that yesterday. I did indeed. Um, I think that was almost, when I, when I got announced in February of one, I kind of put it out of my mind thinking, ah, oh, it's one well in the future. And then we got to about six weeks ago and I got the email, I was like, oh, we need to do a seat fit for your, your test in the 2021 car. And I was like, oh, 2021. I presumed it was the 2013 car like in the past. So um, that was a shock, a nice surprise. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was kind of the, the biggest perk of it all really. So, Let's talk the nitty gritty details. So how long was the test? How much time did you get with the car? And by the end of it, did you feel like reasonably comfortable in the machinery? Yeah, so in the end, I had about 25 push laps, let's say. Um, I think they were quite limited with, with engine mileage, um, as is always the case with the old, older cars. Um, and yeah, I think towards the end, um, I got to a point where I was pretty happy in all the high speed corners. Um, I couldn't really see too much because my neck was gone. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think towards the end, I was I was pretty happy wherever I got to. The team seemed pretty happy. Um, and I was kind of happy within myself that I felt like I got to a, a limit in a lot of the high-speed corners. Um, and some of the data, at least, was comparable to the real drivers, which was cool. How, how tough was it on the body? You mentioned the neck there. Obviously, you, you, you're feeling those G-forces through the corners and, and through braking. But what what other physical emotions can you describe as you're, you're driving around on a push lap? Um, it was quite crazy, to be honest, because I didn't install lap at about 10 a.m. in the morning um, whilst the track was still a bit damp. And I came out of, um, I think it's Arena 2 at Silverstone, and I went full throttle. And I wasn't that, I was like, oh, it's, it's quite fast. Um, didn't feel much quicker than F3. And at the time, I didn't realize, but the hybrid wasn't switched on, and it was still recharging. <laughs> and I came out of Luffield then, and I hit the throttle again, expecting the same amount, and I literally felt sick. It was ridiculous um, when everything was deployed. Uh, it was crazy. I mean, I think my brain still thought I was in Luffer and I was already at the apex of cops. It was ridiculous. Um, but I think once, as all racing drivers say, once you get the feel for, for how fast the car is on full throttle, you almost you almost want more. Um, and I kind of got used to that point. And from then on, once I started pushing the car, I realized um, how capable they really are. That's what I find so impressive because so many drivers have spoken about their first ever time in a car and how, like you said, they felt a bit sick and that they were like, how am I going to handle this? But I guess, you know, you're kind of, you've built up this, um, this talent over so many years that just enables you to, to really quickly kind of get on top of it and go quickly because, you know, jumping in that car, was there any kind of fear factor? Because I imagine that's by far and away the quickest racing car you've ever been in by a long shot, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's more than double the horsepower in F3 in the same weight, pretty much. So, uh, wow. yeah, there's a bit of fear factor. Obviously, you're driving an F1 car with not many spares, which I got told as soon as I arrived, which I think was 
<laughs> <laughs> Don't crash. <laughs> I saw one front wing and one floor, and that was it. I was like, okay, I'm not going to crash. <laughs> Oh, God. Um, can you imagine oh. i know um, and it was damp silvers in october but uh but yeah like you said i think to be honest i think all drivers get to a certain level and you you kind of have to push yourself when you jump into a, a much faster car to get to a point um i think if you almost let's say uh trundle around you kind of get into a mental block where you can't really push um, and especially in these big aero cars um the more you lift or the more you back out at high speed, the more unstable the car becomes. Mm. It's kind of a mental game when I'm turning up to cops, I don't know, 70 miles an hour quicker than normal. And it's like, just, just do it flat and it'll be easier than lifting. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a tricky one. Um, but I think over time and every time you step up a category, you get better at adapting. I, see, just, um, the, go on, go on. I was going to say, this from, reminds me of the... Zach, have you seen the Top Gear episode from back in the day when Richard Hammond was driving the, the old yeah. Renault? It, it, it's like everything he said, like he just couldn't go quickly enough exactly. to actually go quickly. Yeah, that's the thing. After the first run, I came in, I was like, wow, the brakes are so good after the install lap. And they were like, the brake temperatures aren't even reading on our data. <laughs> <laughs> 10 <laughs> times lower than it needs to be. I was like, okay, sorry. <laughs> I was going to ask about the brakes. Like, because the, the step up from F3 into f1 i mean it's a decent jump there but it, things like the braking do you really have to slam your foot to the floor to be honest it's it's a weird sensation because the brake is a, a brake by wire system they have pretty much complete freedom on on how the pedal can be uh so compared to my f3 car it's actually a lot softer the pedal um and i think other drivers have said it in the past but it's a weird sensation because in f3 and f2 cars the steering's super heavy usually the brake pedal's super stiff so you're kind of locking your whole body let's say in high speed corners but in F1, the steering's really light because of power steering. Yeah. Brake pedal's quite light, and all you can feel is your neck being just pulled off. Um, so the first couple of laps, I was just used to having a really heavy wheel, and I didn't really have anything to, to resist against. So it was a bit strange. Um, but yeah, the, the efficiency of the brakes is on another level, really, compared to what I'm used to. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think a couple, the first time I, let's say, properly hit the brakes, I just went, <laughs> and I'm looking at my feet. Um, and then from then on, I had to almost brace myself every time I hit the brakes. And also, one other thing I wanted to ask, obviously the wheel, the complexity of the yeah. wheel, I imagine, did they just set it into, you know, you, you they made it so you didn't have to worry too much about pressing buttons and changing settings, right? We did a bit. They've got a few, uh, like, strategy modes that override everything. So for, depend because it was so cold, we were playing around with the outlap modes, which uh, mm -hmm. can help to get tire temperature. So there'd always be a switch change before and after a lap to recharge the battery. Uh, and at the end, we went into, let's say, a qualifying simulation where... Uh, I was doing quite a few more switch changes, but the problem was actually the radio quality was quite bad. So <laughs> I was a bit lost sometimes. It's mad. Like with all that technology, can't they make a decent radio? I'd, I'd never understand that. Like they're making the fastest cars on the planet, but yet they can't make a decent two way radio. That's what I thought. But anyway, I'm not yeah. going to <laughs> <laughs> um, did, did you, um, what did you do afterwards? Did you go out and, and have a nice meal with the family and take it all in? Like, how, did you celebrate or was it just like, yeah, another day? Uh, another day. I drove back. Well, I drove back home um, and actually had some homework to do because I've got a lesson after this. Oh, so back to reality. Yeah, back to reality. <laughs> I've got off on a bit of homework. Um, but yeah, I mean, nothing too much. It was just kind of a one day of F1 testing, back to, back to reality, he said. <laughs> Ridiculous life. Um, but it wasn't the only Formula One experience you're, you're having because you're part of the, the Williams um, Young Driver Academy. How did that opportunity come about? Where, where did it come from? Who called you? How did that happen? And, and tell us a little bit about what you do with them. Yeah, so it was after my, my GB3 championship winning year or during um, the first kind of conversation started happening with Sven at Williams. Um, They're interested in adding me to their academy for this year. Uh, and eventually, yeah, we buttoned up the deal uh, in February uh, for this year's F3 season. And yeah, in terms of my involvement, I think as far as academies go, they've had a bit of a, a restructure early on this year. Um, and yeah, I'm super involved with the sim. Uh, I've gone to a few race weekends this year. Um, and yeah, more, more involved than I thought I would be, uh, which I've really enjoyed. I've done a few weeks at the factory, um, was going around all the roles and composites, all sorts. So yeah, I've really enjoyed my time. Yeah. And it must be pretty cool seeing um, Logan take the step up, um, seemingly. Again, as long as he gets the super license points, which would take a mathematical, like, yeah. it would take some madness for him to not get P7. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, that must be quite heartening, I suppose, for you. And I know you've done some bits with with Logan as well. So seeing him, you know, Williams have their the faith um, in him as a young driver and give him the opportunity for next season. Exactly. Um, it shows they're willing to, to put young drivers in, which is obviously good on my part as well. Um, and uh, I mean, compared to other academies, not to, to mention any, they're 
seem to be quite proactive at putting the drivers in, which is uh, which is nice um, and gives me a bit of reassurance at least. Yeah. Do you have much to do <clears throat> with the other drivers? I mean, you've got Logan, obviously. We've got uh, Jamie Chadwick, who's won the W Series for about 75 seasons in a row. Uh, uh, Ollie Gray is doing great things in, in F4. Um, do, do you speak amongst the group and, and, and keep in contact with each other? Yeah, obviously it was a bit easier with Logan this year because um, F3 and F2 are always on the same weekend. So uh, any media stuff we could do at the weekend, we go to the, the motorhome, et cetera, and, and do anything like that. Um, also both being Carl and of course the, the trucks from pretty much next to each other every weekend. So we stayed in contact quite a bit. Um, Jamie and Ollie, obviously they normally race at different weekends or W series are separated off a bit from our paddock. Um, but we have, we've had two training camps this year, uh, all, all four of us. Um, so yeah, we're staying in contact. Um, we've been around quite a lot getting to know each other. Yeah. So that relationship with Williams, just on a kind of regular day-to-day -day basis, even like off-race weekends, do you kind of have regular contact or is it more just at those times when you need to be at the simulator? Like, do, do they take, do they do much, I suppose, to, so for example, like when um, Yuki Tsunoda first jumped into F1, you know, that he was in Mitwell Keynes, but then the team decided actually we're going to move him to Fiennes and, and, and like manage him a bit more closely is that that degree of involvement Williams have in your life or is it more just at the weekends? Uh, I think it's what a, a bit at the weekends. Obviously, I'm doing quite a bit of sim work for them um, this year and I guess even and more so next year. Luckily, I'm only about an hour away from the factory, so it's not too bad commute wise. Um, but yeah, like you said, I think it's more race weekend related. Um, obviously, I stay in contact with all the guys in the academy and the people I need to within Williams for sim, etc. But I guess maybe as I get higher up the ranks, the, the involvement might increase. But I think location-wise and everything, it's quite convenient so far, at least. And, and you're obviously a lot closer to Williams than, than the average Joe. Well, what's the vibe like inside the team from your perspective at the moment? It feels like they're starting to, to move in the right direction. Things, things seem to be improving. How is it from an insider's perspective? Really good. Um, I think it's got a... They've managed to keep that kind of family environment that I've heard they've always had, which you can definitely feel. Um, but it's also kind of involving that corporate improvement into the company and trying to obviously inject as much money as they can and improve the team. Um, I think they are making steps forward. Obviously, it's not a, a quick process to, to turn around an F1 team. I think if you make a change in personnel, et cetera, it takes maybe three, four years for, for the changes to become evident on track. Um, so I think in the long term, they, for sure, they will improve. Um, yeah, I think the vibe and everyone's pretty upbeat, um, obviously trying to understand what's going on this year and up, make improvements for next year. Um, but yeah. It's all good. Um, and yeah, I think for sure an improvement, but it perhaps was in the past.